You are listening to a MetalExpressRadio.com interview. Enjoy. Blackie, uh, first of all, uh, after your last album, Kill, Fuck, Die, you went on a tour. Uh, this album sounded a bit different than uh, previous uh, Wasp albums. Uh, it sounds a bit industrial. How did uh, did your, your fans react to, to the new uh, style of uh, Wasp? Uh, Europe had mixed emotions. Uh, America was extremely well received. But, um, you know... When people would use the term industrial, that would always kind of, I wasn't, you know, real enthusiastic about that. Because if you look at a lot of that stuff that bands that are considered industrial are doing now, a lot of that stuff we was doing 10 years ago, you know, so that, and especially... Well, even longer than that. If you go back and you look at some of our early B-sides, you know, we were doing that stuff a long time ago. So that, uh, like I said, I'm not I'm not too sure that, you know, I, I look at that favorably. You know, we were trying to make an extremely aggressive sounding record. You know, we wanted something that if you took a gigantic piece of, Like, if you ever go into a, a factory where they're using any kind of a, what we call a stamp, you know, where like in a, where they make cars and things like that, and you hear these big, gigantic pieces of machinery coming down, stamping this metal, and it goes <laughs> like that. That's the kind of sound, that metallic type sound. That's what we were trying to create. You know, something that sounded like the inside of a, of a metal factory. You know, and so, but it ends up getting interpreted as what people say industrial. And I thought, hmm, you try to make a piece of art, and sometimes people get it, and sometimes they don't. Do the songs uh, sound like that alive as well? No, because what you have is, it's a very basic approach. It's, um, it's two guitars, bass, and drums, you know, it sounds really like old wasp you know so i live is different than records records you know i look at records as as little miniature pieces of art you know and you're trying to either say something musically and or lyrically you know what you're doing and make some sort of a statement and uh but live that's different you know we're not necessarily trying to recreate what we do on on an album with live performance. Mm. Uh, this is your second live album. Uh, when did you come up with the idea to make another live album? Um, actually, we had talked about it a lot before the tour started. So the the plans were in the works even before the tour began. Did you record many of your shows on this tour? Yeah, we did a lot. But what ended up on the album was... Uh, Switzerland, Chicago, Cleveland, and Los Angeles. Hmm. Uh, what about overdubs? I mean, a lot of great uh, live albums um, are uh, contains a lot of uh, overdubs. Uh, what is it like on this uh, new Wasp well, album? We don't have to do that now because when you got enough nights to choose from, you know, Stet, our drummer, he uses uh, in ear headphones, and a lot of people don't realize it, but Stet's playing to a click track every night. And I don't know if you know what a click track is, but click track is what we use in the studio to, for the drummer to keep meter. In other words, to keep his timing. And he, it's, he's not doing that because he can't keep timing. It's just we're using uh, pre-recorded background vocals and things like that and whatever keyboards that we might have used, say, like on Headless Children or something like that. And then that way we don't have to take more musicians out on the road to recreate the records. And I, I freely talk about this stuff because people who say they don't do it are lying. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with it because, I mean, any of those background vocals that are happening live, either I sang them or Stet sang them in the studio, so it really doesn't matter. Problem is, is if there's four vocal parts, I can't sing them all at one time, you know, and somebody says, well... Do you want it to sound closer to the record, or do you want there to be these huge holes? I don't care what anybody says. When I go see a band, I want it to sound 
really, really good. You know, so if they've got to have some recorded help, I got no problem with that, you know. Um, so when you say, was there a lot of overdubs, don't need it because when we're playing from night to night to night, we can take songs from any, say, 10 shows. We could use the first song from the first show, but we could use the third song from the fifth show, the second song from the fourth show, and put them all together. And the timings are going to be the same every night. Mm. So that's the good thing about having your drummer play to a digital click track. <laughs> of course. Uh, I know this is all complicated and everything, but it's... I couldn't answer your question without explaining to you how it works now. I understand. Um, uh, how is this album, uh, this is called Double Live Assassins, uh, like compared to your first live album, Live in the Raw? Very different. The Live in the Raw album, <clears throat> well, the title should have been swapped because this record is more raw than that. That was recorded in arena-type environments. This sounds like it was done in somebody's garage. I mean, everything is dry and very much up in your face. We we mic'd everything live. We knew we wanted to do this, so we mic'd everything very close, and we didn't use any room mics. And because of that, like I said, it sounds like somebody's playing in somebody's garage somewhere. Okay. It's really cool. Yeah. It's really in your face. Uh, the last time I talked to you, we talked a lot about this uh, reunion uh, with uh, Chris Holmes. Uh, have everything worked out uh, all right between you and Chris? Are you doing fine? Have you found the right uh, chemistry again? Finding the chemistry wasn't a problem. The chemistry was always there. You know, it was just... There were peripheral things, you know, outside things that, that drove us apart. And now a lot of those outside influences aren't there anymore. And uh, everything is pretty much back to normal. Hmm. Uh, I've heard you already. Bar, huh? so, <laughs> uh, well, this uh, stage show you, you brought on tour now was more uh, spectacular than ever. Uh, how did uh, your audience react to to that? Well, we've always been extreme, and you try to push the limits a lot of times as to what you think the audience will and won't accept. And Wasp are one of the, and maybe the only truly dangerous band that are out there. I have seen people try to imitate what we do, but they end up coming off, you know, kind of cartoonish, you know, kind of animated. What's always scared people about us is the realism of what we do, and and when I say realism, I don't mean realism of of an actual stage show I mean the realism of our personalities within that stage show and that's what's always frightened people about what we do um, because you know I remember the first time and I've told this story before but I'll tell it again Chris and I were sitting on a bus one day and it was like 1985 or 86 and we're watching TV and PMRC was just really digging into us you know just ripping us a new asshole and Chris looked at me he goes what the fuck is the big deal all about you know and I looked at him and I says I honestly don't know well a few years had to go by before I started to understand what it was all about because I remember we were right in the middle of recording Headless Children which was in like 88 and I had not seen the Live at the Lyceum video, which was the first one that we did. I hadn't seen it in years. And just for the heck of it, I put it on and I watched it. I could then see what was freaking people out. See, I couldn't see it in the beginning because we were just being ourselves. You know, but you have to step away from something sometime till you can see what makes it work. And what I, everybody thinks, you know, that we were so clever and calculated in the beginning. I would like to take credit for that, but in reality, what was happening was people just doing what came naturally, and that's what makes it work then, it's what makes it work now. It's just him and I just being ourselves, you know, letting that part of our personalities come through. So that part of it is what makes us a truly dangerous band, because when people look at it, they go, Holy shit, these guys ain't kidding. <laughs> you know, 
they mean this, you know, and that's that's what makes it different, you know. So a lot of times, especially when you do the type of stage show that we did on this last tour, we freaked a lot of people out. It got so bad that, you know, we were doing the thing where we were crucifying the nun on the stage, and it got so bad down in Spain and Italy, you know, which are largely Catholic countries, the label in Italy was refusing to release our record for a while. I mean, when your own label turns on you, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty radical statement, mm -hmm. you know. But you will keep I mean, it. you expect it from people on the outside, but not on the inside. Of course, but uh, do you then think about it? Uh, maybe we shouldn't do this uh, as extreme as yeah, we do it now. Know, rock and roll is supposed to be dangerous. You know, it's supposed to push the boundaries of what people thought was safe. When it becomes safe or it becomes commercial, that's not rock anymore, that's pop.